the reader, who is insensibly drawn by the familiar expressions into wholly unfamiliar country. Rousseau says one thing and conveys another. He appears to be arguing along old-fashioned lines, but the vision which he projects before the reader is something totally unlike the kind of schema which he appears to borrow from his predecessors. Let us take, for example, such central concepts in his teaching as the notion of liberty, the notion of contract, the notion of nature. Liberty. For Rousseau, the whole idea of compromising liberty, of saying, well, now, we can't have total liberty because that will lead to anarchy and chaos. We can't have complete authority because that will lead to the total crushing of individuals, despotism and tyranny. Therefore, we must draw the line somewhere between, arrange a kind of compromise. This is totally unacceptable. Liberty for him is an absolute value. He looks on liberty as if it were a kind of religious concept. For him, liberty is really identical with the human being himself. To say that a man is a man and to say that he is free are almost the same. What is a man for Rousseau? A man is somebody responsible for his acts, capable of doing good and evil, capable of following the path either of the right or of the wrong. If he is not free, this becomes meaningless. If a man is not free, if a man is not responsible for what he does, if a man doesn't do what he does because he wants to do it, because this is his personal human goal, because in this way he achieves something which he, and not somebody else at this moment, desires. If he doesn't do that, he's not a human being at all. He has no accountability. The whole notion of moral responsibility, which for Rousseau is the essence of man almost more than his reason, depends upon the fact that a man can choose, choose between alternatives, choose between them freely, be uncoerced. If a man is coerced, coerced by somebody else, by a tyrant, or even by material circumstances, then it is absurd to say that he chooses, and for Rousseau, he becomes a thing, a chattel, an object in nature, something from which no accountability can be expected. Tables and chairs, and even animals, cannot be regarded as doing right and wrong, for they know not what they do. And they do not know what they do because they don't do, because they don't act. Action is choosing. Choosing implies selection between alternative goals. Someone who cannot choose between alternative goals because he is compelled, either because he is an object determined in nature, as the physicists have taught, simply a bundle of nerves and blood and bone, simply a collection of atoms, just as much under the sway of material laws as the inanimate objects of nature, either because of that, or alternatively, if he is determined not as things are determined in nature, but because he is bullied or coerced by a tyrant, because he is made the creature of somebody who plays upon his fears or his hopes, somebody who in some way manipulates him as one manipulates a puppet, someone like that is not capable of freedom, not capable of action, and is therefore not a human being. There's no saying, but what? A man in this condition, for Rousseau, a slave, might not be happy. But happiness is not the goal. The goal is to live the right kind of life. And therefore, for Rousseau, the proposition that it may be that slaves are often happier than free men doesn't justify slavery. And for this reason, he rejects the utilitarianism of people like Helvetius. Let me quote. He says, slavery is against nature. He says that the unanimity of servitude is quite different from the unanimity of a genuine assembly of men. To renounce liberty, says Rousseau, is to renounce being a man, to surrender the rights of humanity and even its duties. Such a renunciation is not compatible with man's nature. Now, that means that for a man to lose his liberty is to cease to be a man. And that is why a man cannot sell himself into slavery. For once he becomes a slave, he's no longer a man, and therefore has no rights, no duties, and a man cannot cancel out himself. He cannot commit an act, the consequence of which is that he can commit no more acts. It's exactly like moral suicide. And suicide is not a human activity. Death is not event, an event in life. Liberty, therefore, for Rousseau, is not something which can be adjusted or compromised. You aren't allowed to give away a little bit of it, or much of it. You aren't allowed to barter so much freedom for so much security, so much freedom for so much happiness. That is exactly like dying a little, dehumanizing yourself a little. And the thing which is very passionately held by Rousseau, one of the values 
upon which he really spent more eloquence than almost upon any other is this notion of human integrity. The fact that the ultimate crime, the one sin not to be born, is dehumanization of man, degradation of man, exploitation of man. He spends a great deal of his passionate rhetoric on denouncing those who use other people for their own selfish purposes. Not because they make the people whom they use unhappy, as because in some way they dehumanize them. In some way they make them lose their human semblance. And that is, for him, the sin against the Holy Ghost. In short, freedom for Rousseau is an absolute value. And to say of the value that it is absolute is to say that one can't compromise it at all. Now, so far so good, we now have an attitude towards man which makes of liberty the most sacred of his attributes. Indeed, not an attribute at all, but the essence of what being a man is. But on the, there are other values too. It is impossible simply to declare that freedom, individual freedom, the permission to men to do what they like, a situation in which anybody does anything, is the ideal condition of man, and that for two reasons. First of all, there is the empirical reason. For one reason or another, for one cause or another, men live in societies. Why this happens, Rousseau never quite clearly explains. Possibly because of the inequality of gifts which made some men stronger than others and enabled them to assert their power over others and so enslave them. Perhaps because of some inevitable law of evolution. Perhaps because of a nat natural instinct of sociableness which drives people uh, to live together. Perhaps for the reasons which the encyclopedia stated, division of labor for the purpose of leading a life which satisfies more of men's wishes than the isolated life of savages um, would satisfy. Sometimes Rousseau talks about the savage as if he was happy, innocent, and good. At other times, as if he was merely simple and barbarous. But be that as it may, men do live in society. And since they live in society, they have to create rules whereby human beings must so conduct themselves as not to get in each other's way too much, not frustrate each other, not employ their power in such a way as to abort too many of each other's purposes and ends. And therefore there is simply the empirical problem, how is a human being to remain absolutely free, for if he's not free he's not human, and yet not do everything that he wants for what is freedom if it isn't doing what I want, and not being stopped from doing it. There is also a further and a deeper reason for Rousseau. He was, after all, a citizen of Geneva and deeply affected by its Calvinist tradition. And therefore, for Rousseau, there is an ever-present vision of the rules of life. He is deeply concerned about right and wrong, about justice and injustice. There are certain ways of living which are right and certain ways of living which are wrong. In common with the rest of the 18th century, he believes that the question, how should I live, is a real question and has a real answer like any other factual question. And therefore, however we may come by it, by reason or by some other route, there is some answer to the question, how ought I to live? Now, given that we, I have obtained this answer, or think I have obtained it, then there is a rule of life which says, do thus, do not do thus. This is wrong, this is right. This is just, this is unjust, this is good. This is bad, this is handsome, this is ugly. But once we have rules, once we have laws, once we have some kind of regulations which prescribe human life, what is to happen to liberty? How can liberty be compatible with regulations which, after all, hem man in, prevent him from doing anything he wants, tell him what to do and what not to do, forbid him to do certain things, control him to a certain degree? And Rousseau is very passionate about this. He says, that these laws, these rules of life, are not conventions. They are not utilitarian devices invented by man simply for the purpose of achieving some short-term end. No, not at all. Let me quote from him again. They are graven not on tablets of marble or brass, but on the heart of the citizen. And again, the laws of nature, the sacred imprescriptible law, which speaks to the heart of man and to his reason. And again, he says, the power of willing or of choosing, which is, of course, choosing the right path in this case, is not explicable by any mechanical laws. It is something inherent in man, and the laws which he obeys are something which is absolute from which he must not depart. 